Welcome to this week's Way Forward Workshop Leader Lunch Break, where we are pleased to welcome Andy Jones to our conversation. Andy lives by the mantra that excellence is a team sport. With this mindset, he has built a career of excellence in technology, serving as the vice president at MTM Technologies, and then ascending to CEO of MCPC, where he was recognized as the driver that led the transition of MCPC from a value-added reseller to a market shaper. There, he crafted a job description, which included delight customers, drive growth, develop and recruit talent, identify new opportunities and markets, and keep smiling. I suspect the keep smiling aspect of that job description is hard to maintain in his newer role as CEO of Fortress Full Spectrum Cybersecurity Protection. The mere mention of the word cybersecurity makes many of us quake. Yet Andy's well-equipped, he's been described as multifaceted, dedicated and smart. In addition to giving close attention to his business, he gives back mightily to the community. He serves as a trustee at the MCPC Family Charities. He's an avid biker who has led teams raising over a million dollars for cancer and diabetes research through cycling. He has served on the boards of Team NEO and the Metro Health Foundation. He is a veteran having served our country and a proud girl dad. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Andy. Marianne, thank you. Uh, Michael, thank you. That was uh, that was a whole lot of superlatives and uh, more than I am sure I was uh, deserving of. Um, just uh, just to, to kick us off, obviously the topic is cybersecurity. And I will begin by saying um, cybersecurity is a great field to be in and it's a great one to learn about. Um, I've been doing it now for a handful of years. It's really easy. I'm only 23 years old, so. It's uh, anybody can do it. You're going to love it. Uh, with that, let me bring up my slides and see if I can get technology to be our friend today. Okay. I'll ask the obligatory question that everyone gets on every Zoom call. Can you see the slide? And I get a lot of thumbs up. So we'll just jump right into it. We've already, uh, we've already exhausted the who is Andy Jones. So we'll just skip right through that. Uh, CEO here at Fortress Security Risk Management, headquartered in Cleveland. We serve clients all over the US and in 110 countries around the world. What is the topic today? Cybersecurity. What we all know is that it's increasing in both the frequency, the sophistication, as well as the severity of these cyber attacks, and, and it continues to grow. The cost and complexity barriers for the bad actors have come down. Bad actors are the friendly words that we use to describe cyber criminals because we don't know if we're talking about nation state sponsored cyber terrorism or if we're talking about script kitties and basements in California. But generally the bad actors, the cost of, of the barriers of entry and the cost and the complexity continues to come down. The cost of a cybersecurity attack at this point is measured in fractions of pennies, but the potential damages are measured uh, typically today in millions of dollars. That's what we see as the average. Two biggest threats, uh, just to level set everybody at the same place. Uh, the two biggest ways we see today uh, organizations being compromised is either through what we refer to in the industry as business email compromise, or what you're probably very familiar with, ransomware. Ransomware gets a uh, a much better um, a much better publicity uh, a shot than business email compromise. Uh, everyone is aware of ransomware. It's when you accidentally click on something and the bad actors encrypt your system and then they try to extract some type of payment from you, whether that's in Bitcoin or some other type of uh, typically cryptocurrency. Business email compromise, on the other hand, is when, when the bad actors use typically email, but it can really be almost anything today, Teams, uh, cell phone, text messages, uh, all of those processes, they're trying to circumvent a business process in the event uh, or in an effort to compromise uh, your cybersecurity and extract payment. Usually, business email compromise does not involve encryption of any systems. It's simply, uh, it's simply a grift. Hey, uh, I need you to wire some uh, Amazon gift cards to some employees in Indiana, or I need you to... Uh, uh, approve this wire transfer to one of our vendors. Um, these happen all the time. The, the reason I say ransomware gets a little bit more publicity uh, from for 
by a show of Zoom hands, which maybe everyone knows how to do that. Uh, how many of you are familiar with, uh, with ransomware? You've heard that expression before. I'm going to say the majority. Uh, how many of you have heard the expression business email compromise? A couple. Uh, business email compromise uh, using the FBI's data is somewhere between 15 and 20 times larger uh, from an impact nationally annually. So it's a significantly bigger number. But these are the two primary vehicles or two primary, primary types of attacks that we see uh, on a daily basis. One of the things that may surprise you, we hear a lot uh, in, in the news uh, or in chats or, or in articles we read about the bad actors. And we typically hear them referred to as kind of the nation state or what we in the industry refer to as nation state sponsored cyber terrorism. You can think of that as China or North Korea or uh, or Iran or, uh, uh, or 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 China, sorry, or Russia. Uh, those are the ones you hear most commonly as the nation state sponsored uh, cyber terrorism. Interestingly enough, even though we hear that as the cause or the culprits most of the time, only about two percent of uh, the daily attacks that occur are actually originating or 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 are actual nation state sponsored terrorism. The overwhelming majority are just criminal enterprises. You can think of these as your next generation of uh, of crime syndicates. And the majority of them uh, exist outside of this idea of a nation state, whether they're whether they're based in in Russia or elsewhere, many of them, uh, sadly, are based right here in the United States, or they have activists and or they have uh, coders and attackers right here in the US. The guys in the middle, the hacktivists, uh, those are usually your uh, environmental, uh, uh, or they have some cause, there'll be an environmental cause. They don't agree with your business practice. Maybe you're an oil company and they're, uh, they're out to do damage with you that way. But the, the takeaway from this, the overwhelming majority of, of cyber attacks are actually just good old fashioned criminal enterprise uh, that has been going on for years. We typically associate it with you know, what we would think of in the 20s and the 30s with mob activity. It is the same activity. It's just being done, conducted electronically today. 80% of successful attacks uh, come through people. People are the weakest link. It's usually someone is clicking on something that they shouldn't have clicked on, or they've received an email or a text uh, or a Teams chat or a Zoom chat with something that they shouldn't have clicked on. We, probably like in your organization, we spend a tremendous amount of time training associates on how not to click on things because if we don't recognize it, we shouldn't click on it. Unfortunately, in the best case scenario, the best trained organizations still click about three or 4% of the time. So if you have 100 employees and they receive one piece of bad email, three to four of them are going to click on it. When you multiply that by the number of emails coming in per day, uh, it, it gives you a sense of it's not if, but when. One of the things that's compounding this is the idea of AI. Uh, if you've been watching the news at all in the last six months, you've seen a rise of artificial intelligence articles and news. Um, we've been using AI in the cybersecurity industry for a decade. Uh, it's not widely publicized. It's not something that everyone talks about, but we use AI as a tool on uh, in the cyber side, on, on the, we'll call them the white hat side, the good guys and girls side. We use AI to help us sift through and sort through millions and millions of attacks a day to find out which ones are legitimate and which ones are not to be able to better serve our clients. The tool sets we use allow us to do this. What's become more fascinating over the last year or so is that the AI engines are starting to be used to create malware. So the bad actors are taking what used to be a pretty challenging task and they're using AI to build it. If you've seen the examples of AI being used to create text or write papers, it can do the exact same thing for malware. You literally say, give me a piece of malware that exploits this, write a piece of code, and it will do that. 
From a talent standpoint, uh, recently the FBI Director Christopher Wray actually spoke specifically to Congress around where we are when it comes to these cyber wars. Right now, if we dedicated every FBI agent that was involved in cyber crime toward a defending attacks just from China, just from China, we would be outnumbered 50 to 1. How do you handle cybersecurity? It's any other risk. It's a business risk. You either have to avoid it, reduce it, accept it, or transfer it. Uh, avoiding it, probably not a great idea of how you're going to go about doing that. Reducing it, there are ways that you can help reduce it through a, a cyber program, and we'll talk about a little bit of that at the end. Accept it. Sometimes you have to simply accept a portion of the risk, and, and we can go into a four-hour conversation just on this. And then the last one is transfer it. That's the application of cyber insurance policies to be able to help mitigate some of that risk. What we're finding, not just in the cybersecurity market, I'm sorry, not just in the cyber insurance market, but in the market as a whole, there's quickly becoming a haves and a have-nots. There are those organizations that have the ability to receive cyber insurance, meaning that they are a good risk, and the majority of organizations are actually considered poor risks or bad risks, and they will be unable to secure a cybersecurity policy. Premiums continue to go up, and we see new sublimits being placed on cyber insurance policies. One of the most recent ones that we've seen that, that is an alarming trend there, there seems to be an idea now that if you're not maintaining your patching levels, uh, that you're going to receive a reduced payout at time of, 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 of an attack. And so much so that most of them are reducing your payout as much as 50%. Insurance is for accidents. Insurance is not for negligence. So remember that when we're applying it. We're seeing an increase in regulation to help drive not only the Fed, but organizations that service the Fed to apply more stringent uh, data protection laws and more data protection processes, whether that's protecting individual privacy or protecting intellectual property. And we're seeing this transition into public organizations. There's a new rule set that is being, has been proposed by the SEC that's suggesting that going forward, if you are a publicly traded organization, you would be required to have members of your directors, your board of directors that are cyber aware and cyber savvy to help guide the organization because there's such a deficiency. Look for this to continue to evolve. This came out earlier this year, or later last year with the intention of that becoming a rule this year. So we'll see if that makes it through. As far as that public company security risk, what would it be? You would have to help with registering of the policies and procedures. You'd have to define the management's role, whether, whether they're responsible for implementing cybersecurity policies and procedures or helping create it. And then they've defined, uh, again, this board of directors cybersecurity risk. It looks to be that they're trying to create a, a more direct and uh, a more actionable fiduciary responsibility about cybercrime and taking those responsibilities uh, seriously, including disclosing anything recently on your 8Ks. Third-party reliance. One of the largest areas that we're seeing explode is the reliance on third-party contractors, managed service providers, remote work environments, and how that's playing into cybersecurity. Last year, 19% of breaches that occurred domestically were a result of a partner or third party being breached and it's spilling into your environment. So one in five uh, of these attacks are not something you've done, it's something your partners have done. So we're seeing a mod we're seeing a change in approach of how we monetize and, and account for third party risk and it's moving into that risk officer's responsibility. Supply chain attacks have continued to rise. 98%, uh, again, this is uh, last year's data, but 98% of uh, those surveyed supported, or sorry, reported that they had been negatively impacted from supply chain troubles that were a result of a cybersecurity attack. We, we see this every day and twice on Sunday uh, throughout the last year and a half 
as the supply chain struggled the, the, to keep up, whether that's the IT supply chain or the manufacturing supply chain for automobiles, et cetera, we see attackers using that as an example or a way to leverage it further and disrupt the supply chain through cyber attacks and slow it down, whether it's vendor payments or what have you. As more and more organizations move to a cloud first strategy, which by the way, is the correct strategy for most organizations, we're seeing more and more of the attacks move to that space. 45% of attacks last year occur, occurred in the cloud. They were not your on-premise network. It wasn't the equipment that you maintain in your facilities. It was something that you do to conduct business in the cloud, whether it's your ERP application, perhaps your uh, your HR application, or perhaps your online web commerce. But 45%, uh, that, is, that is up significantly last year. Why? Easy to attack, large baskets, easy, uh, big attack surface. Moving on. One of the last areas we see that the threat actors are looking at is MSPs, so managed service providers. For your organization, if uh, if you do outsource portions of your IT, which most do, as you move, as this move to outsource continues, we're seeing the, again, bigger basket, bigger threat. It's easier to attack an MSP or an MSSP uh, and gain access there because in essence, it's like attacking your phone company. Now, all of a sudden, you have access to all the phones. One of the challenges we see continuing to confound all this is this cyber talent gap that continues to grow. So we've got numbers here for both the US, uh, total US cyber workforce for last year, as well as the global workforce. Last year, about 4.6 million people globally worked in the cybersecurity industry. About 1.1 of those were here domestically in the US. Why this is a problem, is we're seeing a gap upwards of 770,000 jobs here in the US. What does that mean? At the end of 2022, when we exited the year, there were 770,000 cybersecurity jobs posted that went unfulfilled and 3.4 globally. What does that mean for us as US citizens or as operators of businesses here domestically? It means that this talent gap is going to continue widening and we're going to see continued pressure on access to that talent. Where I'm seeing it, or where we're seeing it, I should say, it's your typical, it's where we see large, large amounts of, uh, of economy, whether it's Texas or California or Illinois, New York State, states that have large populations or have large existing economic infrastructure those are the ones that are sucking up cyber talent. Why is this a problem for us here in Northeast Ohio? Cyber talent is a global role. That talent can work anywhere. They don't have to work domestically. They don't have to work in our backyard for one of our, our Fortune 100 or Fortune 500 companies here in Cleveland. They're being recruited to work internationally at this point. We've, had, uh, we've lost a few people over the last few years to operations in Nevada. This continues to be a challenge because of the separation of logical operation. We don't see this gap changing too much. So when I say there's a, a, a haves and a have nots, talent is going to become a have and a have not as well. Major healthcare organization five years ago had 12 cybersecurity people on their staff. Today, five years later, they have 120. Cybersecurity people want to be around like-minded people, and there aren't that many of them. It's harder for them to go to a smaller organization and convince the executive team to make the appropriate investments. So we see them typically aggregating in very large organizations that have already bought into the importance of cyber and are making the investments, or to come work in an organization like ourselves where they're surrounded by cyber talent. You won't find too many cyber people standing alone in smaller organizations. There'll be a, a much higher turnover. With this huge talent shortage that we just discussed, we've got another problem that's kind of facing the industry right now. And it's frankly, it's the idea of burnout. We were asking cyber professionals to do more and more work because there's more and more work to be done, even though there isn't enough talent. And we have, a, we have, we have, we have burnout on a massive scale. 
in the aviation industry, pilots have laws and rules they have to follow around how many hours they're allowed to work for the safety of flight. We don't have anything like that on the IT side, but we make the same mistakes. People under stress, people that are exhausted, tend to continue to contribute to this idea of human factors contributing to an overall diminished state of cyber readiness. This is going to continue to be a problem as we move forward, and you'll see us leaning into the industry as a whole, leaning more into tools and techniques to help mitigate this talent shortage. So all of these things, whether it's the talent shortage, whether it's the, the, uh, the ease of access, the lower cost of entry uh, for, for bad actors, or, or what has quickly become the, one of the, the second largest, most profitable industry in the world, cybercrime, I know it's right behind healthcare. Uh, all of these things are conspiring to create kind of this perfect storm for organizations. And it's going to get harder and harder to find and retain the talent or develop the program. So how do we, how do you help an organization become what we think of as cyber resilient? Straight off the, uh, straight off the White House's website, uh, we have developed something we call the basic eight. It's very straightforward. If you're not technical, don't worry about it. You're not expected. There will not be a test at the end of this. But these are the eight things that if an organization does, they will, I'm not guaranteeing that they will not be attacked because you're going to be attacked every day, constantly. Uh, that large healthcare organization that I mentioned receives a, about a million to a million two in attacks every single day. It doesn't mean that you will be impervious to attack. It means that you will be resilient and able to keep fighting. One of the things that we recommend right out of the gate is it's securing the attack surface. It's this thing called EDR. I won't boil the ocean on that. The number two thing is patching. Organizations do very poor jobs at patching their environment. Multi-factor authentication, monitoring, being able to create immutable backups, being able to encrypt your data, having a response plan and testing it, and then obviously continuing to educate and train your associates on what to do and what not to do and how to communicate back are critical. With that, that is the 12 to 15 minutes that I had. I was gonna <laughs> stop and turn it back over to you guys for questions. Thank you, Andy. We appreciate your time and your work in this area. And we have had a couple questions come in. You mentioned the problem with email and, and we're curious, how can companies uh, audit employees or manage their workforces um, to see if they're falling for malware email messages and are there some best practices and do they differ between size of companies? Uh, so there were several questions in there and I will, I will start with probably the easiest one and then we'll go from there. So one of the very best practices that organizations can do is conduct your own phishing experiments internally. And whether, whether you have the staff to do that or you outsource that, you want to create your own phishing emails and target them to people in your organization. And you want to create them from easy, meaning, hey, half of these sentences don't even make sense and there's disconnected grammar and whatnot. You want to make them easy to check and easy to see. And then you want to make them extremely challenging. We did, and I'll just give you a very concrete example. Internally, we did our own phishing, one of our many phishing campaigns a year or so ago internally. And uh, I gave the cyber team the green light to spoof an email from human resources. And the email was, hey, uh, which it worked out fine. I don't remember the specific month, but it was whatever month was like National Fitness Month. And it was, hey, for all the associates who want to participate in this, we're giving away some gift cards to Amazon for uh, fitness equipment. We're also giving away some Fitbits, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I won't disclose the number of people that not only clicked, but clicked, and then we were able to harvest their credentials, meaning their username and password. They willingly surrendered it to us in order to be registered to potentially win a Fitbit. And these are people that are trained to not do those things at a level that you can't imagine. So short answer is test your own employees, train them. And when they fail, which they will, remedial training. Hey, let me show you why this email was bogus or what you should have done and how you could have clicked this report button 
um, you'll find it, it's eye opening. And, and if they do fall it or fall for it, or when they do fall for it, what does the company do then? I mean, if, if it was a real one, where does that leave the company? So, so uh, this has created, all, and I am not going to sit here and pretend to be the great HR guru, but I will tell you, it has created for many organizations a whole new area of of HR thought of how many times do we retrain an associate before we either move them into a non-privileged, non-critical role where they have access to information. You can think of your finance departments or your HR departments. If it's, if it's a clinical environment, you can think of any of the primary caregivers, nursing, doctors, et cetera. At what point do you take away the tools that they're using uh, to do that? Again, not going to pretend to uh, uh, to discuss that in any great detail because it could take six hours and we still won't get to the bottom of it. Um, but from a it, it, that's a practice exercise. From an external exercise, we regularly see a pretty even split. Some organizations will terminate associates that click on an errant email that creates a a problem internally, whether it's distribution of funds or a ransomware event. Uh, about 50% of the time, they'll terminate the employee. About 50% of the time, they'll take pity on them for a, hey, this is happening to everybody. We know you've been trained, but how do we, uh, how do we help you to not do that again? What I will tell you is uh, usually those employees that accidentally click on something, you, you generally, the first time it happens, they won't fall for it as easily again. Thank you. Speaking of talent, you mentioned HR issues several times in your presentation. You talked about talent gap and us being outnumbered in the U.S. What's being done to encourage careers in, in this area, either for young people and how can we inspire them into the work or for those who might be looking for new careers or retraining? So, so uh, I will say five years ago that I felt like as a society, we were a little flat-footed on this specific topic, and I'm, I'm speaking entirely of the entire United States. Uh, we were definitely a little flat-footed. Five years ago, if you picked uh, any one of the great universities or colleges in, in the region, one of them had a cybersecurity program, maybe two. Uh, today, the majority of them have a cybersecurity program. So there is an effort to accelerate the creation of that. Uh, I do know that uh, the, the Fed has gotten behind it. For, uh, for those of us that remember the, the Job Corps promos in the 70s and the 80s, where you could go serve or teach in Africa for a year or two and then come back and your college loans would be forgiven. There's a similar program today for IT experts where if you agree to work in the federal government for two years in an IT capacity, they will pay for your college tuition. So uh, uh, it's IT Job Corps. You can go out and, and take a look. And there are many other organizations, whether it's whether it's GCP and the right team that's out there uh, evangelizing, whether it's Team Neo and the Talent Development Council that are out evangelizing in school systems, career opportunities uh, that are available to, to young folks. I think that it's, it's slowly coming up. What I will say is this, um, there's a disconnect between a a thought that you need a four-year degree to be a cybersecurity expert. Uh, that is not the case. We frequently hire people with certifications only or one, and by certifications, I mean industry certifications, or they have a, a certificate from a, a one-year program or a two-year associate degree granting program. Those folks are equally valuable in the industry today. Well, thank you, and you covered a lot of ground in a little bit of time, and we appreciate it. And uh, I think I'm going to stay off email the rest of the day and turn it over to Marianne to close us out. Yeah, no one opened any emails for the rest of the afternoon. Andy, this was simultaneously fascinating, interesting, and terrifying. So thank you for sharing so much incredibly valuable information.